All right, what's up guys? Today, I'm finally gonna be talking about how to use Docker on your Synology NAS. This has been requested about 150 times and I'm finally getting around to do it. I had some trouble with Docker at first, but now I finally realized how the entire thing works together and I'm a lot more comfortable with it and I can finally give a tutorial in it. So I'm planning on doing a few different Docker tutorials, but for this first one, I'm gonna be going over primarily the concepts. That'll probably be about the first half of this video. And then I'll do a demonstration using Handbrake, which should do a pretty good overview of everything you need to do to set up a Docker container from looking what folders it needs and kind of going through the documentation. All right, so first off, what is Docker and what is a Docker container? So a Docker container is somewhere in between a virtual machine and an application. So virtual machines have a huge advantage for a couple of reasons. First off, they're really well segmented, which is great for security. It is incredibly difficult for someone who's in a virtual machine to be able to break out of that virtual machine and affect the host. And so they're very secure in that sense. Another thing that's awesome about them is they're software independent. It doesn't matter what your hypervisor is, it can run just about any virtual machine. That means I can take a virtual machine that I created on DSM and drag it and drop it into a hypervisor running XCPNG. And just like that, it will work like nothing ever happened. They're also great because you can take snapshots. You can take a snapshot of an entire operating system as it was and revert back to that. And with B2RFS and Synology, they're incredibly thin snapshots. They do not take up much space at all and so you can keep them from years and years and years. And so it's a great way to be able to restore backups from critical failure. However, virtual machines have a big disadvantage in that they're very inefficient. Basically, you're running multiple instances of operating systems on top of an operating system, which even with the most efficient hypervisor still has a huge overhead. And they're very RAM hungry and things like that and you end up with just a lot of junk in there that you don't need. So then on the application side, it's actually running on the kernel of the main machine, meaning it's way lighter, way more efficient. However, it has the disadvantage of not really working if you drag and drop from one to another. And there's not that same security trust. If an application breaks, it is wide open and they are on the operating system. So a Docker container is somewhere in between. Docker containers run on the host kernel, which means they're way more efficient and you don't need a bunch of extra operating system junk to have them. And so you can actually have instances of hundreds or even thousands in some cases of Docker containers running on one machine because they're so lightweight. It also means you can spawn them off and kill them very quickly without having to wait for an entire operating system to boot up. Then there is some segmentation from the host OS, meaning you can actually restart a Docker container, and there is at least some blockade between it and the kernel. But fundamentally, if somebody writes good enough of software that has been shown to be able to be broken, so they're not perfectly secure, then again, neither are virtual machines for that case. So Docker is great for Synology, because Synology does not have a ton of resources. And so the extra overhead of running a bunch of virtual machines makes it very inefficient. Another core concept of Docker containers are the environmental variables. These can either be passed through using scripting. If you're doing something like a Docker swarm, basically a bunch of Docker containers all running and spawning on their own for a common purpose, or it can be used to configure a Docker container which is what most of them do for one-off uses, such as a handbrake container or many other ones where you just need to set up a config for when it spawns. All right, and so now let's just go ahead and set up Docker. So go ahead and log into DSM. And the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is download it from the package center. So just go into package center and search for Docker. And it's this one right here with the uh, whale and just click install. All right, and so now that it's gone ahead and installed, let's go ahead and open it. 
And so it's got this wizard right here and it basically tells you, hey, you need to make sure to read the manual and things like that. We'll say not, don't show again and just close it out. All right, and so first off, we've got Docker open right here. I'll go ahead and close out that. And let's go into file station. And we can see right here that it's auto created this Docker shared folder. And so that's where we're going to put all the stuff for our Docker containers. And so anytime you need a file, you're basically going to do a link to that there. So the way Docker works is you create virtual links, basically linking from files in here into files into the container. So basically any folder that you put in here and link it, you will link it to the operating system that Docker thinks it's running in between. It's a little confusing. You've got, you've got to play around with it, but you're kind of working within an operating system within an operating system. And so it acts almost like a virtual machine, but it's not really because it's actually still running the same operating system, even though the entire directory tree looks completely different. All right, and so we'll go through this. So overview, it will show you what containers are running and how much RAM you have. Just a side note, I'm running this within my virtual machine that I use to demo these tutorials. And so we're gonna get some pretty poor performance, but that's just for this tutorial because we're running a Docker container within a virtual machine. And then right here are our container tabs. They're gonna be empty because we have yet to get any images. Then we've got a registry. This is probably where you're going to be downloading the vast majority of your Docker containers from. And you can just search for anything and copy the Docker container from there. Then once you download something, it'll go in the images folder. And finally, here's our network. So network is mostly used for the really complex versions of Docker that is basically having multiple Docker containers all working together. I'm not going to go into that right now. I might do that in the future once I better understand it and if people think that would be helpful, but it gets very complicated, though it can be very efficient. And finally, here are our log files. So now let's go about setting up a container. So let's just go into the registry and we're going to search for Handbrake. And so this first result right here is the one we're going to go with. I actually know that because I've tested it out and I've used it before. And then they're also ranked by how many star count there are. And so that's kind of a way of favoriting things, which can help you sort things out. So first, we're going to go ahead and download it. And we're going to first choose a tag. The tag is basically the version that has been released. And so latest will give you the latest stable version. Then dev latest would be an unstable version that's used for development. And then if you want an older version, they're all here. But we're going to choose latest and just hit select. And so you can see that this image popped up and it's currently downloading. And so now let's read the manual. So it's really easy to do. It's just this web link right here. And it's going to open it in a new tab. And this is the documentation for it. All right, and so here, is the documentation. This is very similar to GitHub documentation. And so it will go over the things you need. And so things to look for are what directories something needs. So if we look right here, it needs a slash output and a slash watch file. And these, if you look down here, is basically this slash watch file will basically convert any file you drop in there automatically and drop it into the output file. Then it says right here that it creates a GUI on port 5800. That actually is the GUI for Handbrake. And so that's a nice thing about a lot of Docker containers is they can actually very easily spawn their own GUIs. And so you get a much more interactive experience. All right, and so this is what we would have to run if we were doing this via command line. However, we're using the Docker GUI, which is provided with DSM. So these are all going to be environmental variables. And so now this is basically what the Docker needs. We need a output file and a watch file for sure. All right. And so in that case, let's go ahead and go back into our DSM. So it's downloaded. 
But first, let's go into this Docker folder in FileStation. And let's actually create ourselves a directory for this Handbrake app. So we're just gonna create one. We'll call it Handbrake. All right, and so within here, we're just gonna go ahead and create an output folder and a watch folder. And I would recommend keeping these in the Docker shared folder that's created because that way the permissions will work. You can put them in other directories and link them. However, it does cause issues sometimes with the permissions. So just put them in there and it's a lot easier. All right, and so now that we've created those, we're gonna go ahead and launch this image into a container. So just click launch. We'll just call it handbrake. Now here's where you can set up resource limitation. Now it's only priority based. With a virtual machine, you can dedicate it X number of cores, but since this is all running on the same kernel, there's no logic for that. You can only say, I want this to run less or I want this to run more compared to other apps. But if nothing else is running, it will just take up all the CPU power it can. So we'll put this at a low priority and you can have it a hard memory limit, which is good. And let's go into advanced settings. So we can auto restart, which is always good to have. So we can choose to have the container restart if it all of a sudden crashes. And we can also have a shortcut. And so from that documentation, it said, create a web link on port 580. So we're just gonna do that. And that way we'll have a shortcut on the desktop right here that if we click it, we'll go to this Docker page. Now let's go to volume. And this is where we're going to mount those folders that we created. And so we're gonna add a folder and under Docker, handbrake, which is what we created, we'll do an output. And now the virtual mount path. So we're gonna put that as output. And so now we'll do the same thing, but for the watch file. And so the way you should think about this is basically the Docker container is just going to see this slash watch file at the root directory. Then anything in there is actually going to be mounted on our Synology as this Docker handbrake watch file that we created. And so basically it's a symbolic link from the Synology DSM operating system to the section of it that is the Docker container. And the same thing for the output file. Now for network, we don't need to do anything. And then for port settings, we're just going to give the container the port ports that it wants. So it's 5,800 and 5,900. So most dockers come preloaded with the container ports that they need. And so unless you have a reason not to, I would just have the local port be the same as the container port. So that way the documentation makes more sense and you don't have to remember, oh, the container thinks it's this port, but it's actually this port. Then under links, we don't have anything for that. That is for when you're having multiple Docker containers all working together. And finally, these are the environmental settings. And so this came preloaded. And so we can go down and this is the preloaded configuration basically. And so we could choose a different preset and we would just enter it in here. We select the GUI, we select the config file and everything from here. And so a lot of Docker containers come basically pre-set up or right out of the box, they will just work. All right, and so now that we've gone through all the settings, let's go ahead and just hit apply. And we'll go back and go to next. And so now it's gonna show us all the options that we have. And this is basically everything that we've set up. And so we're just gonna go ahead and start it. And it's going to start up the container as soon as this is done. One other thing to note, Say we wanted to add additional configuration. Let's go back into the documentation. And for this specifically, it's actually on GitHub. And so if we go down, it will have a section about what kind of environmental variables can be used here. And so you can set up any of these additional environmental variables and set them to whatever you need to do additional configuration. But the nice thing is a lot of Docker containers just out of the box have them preloaded to at least get you up and running. And then if you would like extra information, that's here. All right, and so now it's up and running. So we can use this link that we set up to go to the GUI. 
And just like that, we are now in the GUI where we can upload things and it will do it automatically. And it will work like a web GUI. So there are a bunch of different options here, but they're pretty straightforward. So now let's go in and test that watch folder that we created. So right here, I've got this watch folder, right? So I've already uploaded a file right here. And so we're going to copy a file from this general folder into that watch folder. And that way it's going to automatically get loaded in there. So let's go back to the GUI really quickly. And just like that, it now is encoding this video file that I dropped in there. And this is just an MOV file that came out of my camera from an earlier demo. And one thing to note, it's going to be fairly slow because it's only CPU encoding. It's not using any GPU encoding and it's also in a virtual machine. So it's, it's pretty slow. All right. And so now that that's done, let's go in and see what happened. So we're back in and we're going to go from the watch folder to the output folder. And we can see right here, it is re-encoded this video from a .mov to a .mp4 with the fast preset set up. And so any files you drop in there will automatically get configured. And so that's a pretty brief overview of how to set up a Docker container and kind of how to read through the documentation. There's more info on the environmental variables that I'll get into it at another time, but basically everything works together to run these apps right out of the box generally. And so it's really nice, but it also allows you further customization. And so I think that should be enough to get you at least started using Docker containers. If you've got any specific containers you're having trouble with or want to know more information about, go ahead and put that in the comments below and have a good one. Bye.